Hello everyone. My name is Stephanie and I'm an event host for Bank Square Books and Savoy Bookshop and Cafe. We are delighted that you are able to tune in to this evening's virtual event or to today's virtual event. What time is it? It's the afternoon. <laughs> there are just a couple of things to go over before we begin. Um, there are a couple of quick setting modifications that we want to encourage you to make on Zoom that might make this experience a little bit more interactive. So if you escape out of full screen, you can activate the chat and the Q&A features on Zoom. If you want to participate in the chat, be sure to set your chat settings to all panelists and attendees. We definitely want to encourage you to chat in during the event, so be sure to say hello and let us know where you're watching from. And I already see quite a few people doing just that. Awesome. We just ask that you adhere to our virtual event code of conduct, which has already been posted in the chat. You can also ask questions using the Q&A module at the bottom of the screen, as well as vote for those that are most interesting. And we will get to those audience questions towards the end of the event. This event is being recorded, so if you have to leave or step away for a minute, you can always revisit the recording later on. And if you'd like to order a copy of today's of the books that we're discussing today, we will be posting links in the chat throughout the event. And we will definitely be posting links to both Christie's book and to Kristen's book. These links are going to take you over to our website where you can complete your purchase. And I believe that books purchased today, um, that Christie's books purchased today through the link will come with some really lovely signed book plates. So without further ado, I am delighted to introduce Christy Woodson Harvey, author of Under the Southern Sky, and Kristen Harmel, author of The, Lost, the Book of Lost Names. So Christy Woodson Harvey is the USA Today bestselling author of seven novels, including Feels Like Falling, the Peachtree Bluff series, and Under the Southern Sky. Her writing has appeared in numerous online and print publications, including Southern Living, Traditional Home, and USA Today, and her books have received numerous accolades, including Southern Living's Most Anticipated Beach Reads. She blogs with her mom, Beth Woodson, on Design Chic and loves connecting with fans on her website. She lives on the North Carolina coast with her husband and son, where she is always working on her next novel. And we also have Kristen Harmel joining us today. She is the New York Times bestselling author of a dozen novels, including The Book of Lost Names, The Winemaker's, the Winemaker's Wife, The Room on Rue Amelie, and The Sweetness of Forgetting. And her newest book, The Force of Vanishing Stars, will be out in July. Kristen is also the co-founder and co-host of the popular web series, Friends in Fiction, and she lives in Orlando, Florida. So Christy and Kristen, if you would like to come up on screen, we would love to say hello and jump right in. Hi. Hello. Hi, thanks for having Hi. us, Stephanie. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know this is going to be a really fun event. So I'm going to disappear because you guys are tired of hearing from me, I'm sure. <laughs> and I will let you <laughs> take it away. Okay, oh. wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephanie. What a great in introduction. Yes. Um, so we are so happy, everybody, that you're here today. I cannot wait to talk to Christy about Under the Southern Sky, which I loved. Um, I, I recognize a lot of names out there. I know a lot of you are here from Friends in Fiction. And if you're not, yeah. hopefully we can coax you into becoming members. We're going to um, try. That's what you're really try. here for. It's, it's good times. <laughs> but, you know, Christy... Um, we did a really, really, really fun launch with Christy last week for Under the Southern Sky. So we're going to dig a little deeper today, talk about a few more things. Um, but I also want to make sure you all know that you have a chance to ask Christy your questions too. So if you have a question for Christy, put it in the Q&A. If you go to the three little dots below that say more, um, or you might actually even have a Q&A button. But if you don't, if you click on that more, uh, little more box um, and just put them in the Q&A and we'll be able to pull them through there in the second half. And you can ask Kristen a question too. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly Christy, this is, we're launching her book. My, you, you guys have all heard me talk for the last year about my book. It's old news. <laughs> I love it. So, I'm sorry. No, I, was just, I was going to tell you all as I'm looking at my background, I was going to let everyone know that I am um, in St. Simons right now. I'm on tour. Um, if you if you follow me on Instagram, you are very aware because I'm posting about it everywhere I go. Uh, but I'm in St. Simons and I'm actually in there um, used 
bookstore sale room doing this event. So that's uh, what's going on behind me here in case you were wondering. Well, and, and it's funny, before we came on today, Christy was explaining that as if it was a problem to have gigantic piles of cardboard boxes behind you. And I won't horrify you all with this, but if you turn my camera just a little bit, it's like all cardboard boxes over there. Well, I mean, <laughs> we have a book about to come out. It's just all, I mean, the, yes. the boxes just start to take over the house. Yes, I mean, that's become, just all there is to it. You become like a shipping studio. But Christy, yes. I, I want to talk about your book, but you, that was kind of the perfect segue to talking okay. about, can you tell us about this last week? You mentioned that oh you're gosh. on tour yes. and I know you've kind of had a crazy week. Um, can you tell us where you've been, what you've done and what it's all been like kind of getting back out there? Um, oh my gosh, it has been so fun. So I think I've been on tour since not last Wednesday, but the Wednesday before last. So, um, it's been amazing to get to be like out in the world and seeing people again and meeting readers. And I know you feel the same way, but oh my gosh, I have missed seeing people so much. And um, I've been in like some really great places. We sort of condensed the tour down. It's pretty small. Actually, I'm going home tomorrow afternoon, which is great. But then I still have a bunch more virtual events to come if you haven't. Well, I was going to say if you haven't been able to catch one, but since you're all here, you're catching you're one, right? Really catching one. <laughs> yes. Um, and so, um, yeah, it has been it has been really great. And um, someone is trying to walk in the store. Sorry. Super. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. This is why you don't do events sitting in a library bookstore. No, stop. Um, it's fine. Okay. But uh, no, it's been, it's been really great. I've been some really fun places. I've just been driving. My husband um, met me on Friday in Atlanta, which is great because he's with me now. And okay. so uh, we're going to Beaufort, South Carolina tomorrow. And it's just been amazing. I'm so thankful for everyone who has shown up and um, especially like there've been so many friends and fiction people in the audience at every event that I've done. And um, it's just been great to see how um, it's really changed things. I mean, it really has. It's been incredible. And then, of course, everywhere I go, like half of my talk is about friends and fiction and like trying to recruit the people who are not there. I'm like, got my little bookmarks. And I'm, I mean, really, it's so fun to talk about it, like just makes me happy. So um, so thanks to everybody who has come um, in real life or virtually and uh, to see me because it's just been a really stellar week. Well, it's been super fun to watch it all unfold on Facebook and Instagram and see all your pictures and see all the fans posting about, you know, how so excited fun. they are to get to see you. So, um, so I wish I got to see you right now in person. I, I feel know. sad that I'm not one of those people at your bookstore events, but we will soon. We will. Yes. Yeah, so Christy, can you start off today by telling us a little bit about Under the Southern Sky? Yes. Um, so Under the Southern Sky is a story about an investigative journalist named Amelia who is working on a big story about what people do with their leftover frozen embryos. And she's snooping around a doctor's office and she accidentally um, discovers a list of embryos that have been deemed abandoned. And if you, um, you know, watch the news or you've read your newspapers, this is kind of a big deal right now because so many people have done in vitro fertilization and um, different fertility treatments. And there are all these frozen embryos that people have sort of left unclaimed and are not paying for their storage. And so it's a big ethical conundrum right now of what can be done with these embryos because some people consider them to be life or at least viable life. So um, she's looking through this list and she sees a name of someone she recognizes and that is her childhood friend Parker and his late wife Greer. And she knows she has to tell Parker that these embryos have been you know, deemed abandoned because their fate is sort of up in the air. And so she tells him and then he is put in the unenviable situation of having to decide what to do with what is the last remaining part of the woman that he loved so much. And so um, we get to hear from Parker and Amelia in this story, and then also Greer through her journal entries. That's Parker's late wife. And then Elizabeth, who is Amelia's mom and one of my very favorite characters. She, um, she's quite the meddler and she has a lot of ideas about what her daughter should be doing with her life. And she is not always doing it correctly. So we all need a good Southern mama to tell us what to do every now and then. Um, but all of these characters have a secret, at least one. Um, and actually Kristen helped me come up with one of them. I don't, we need to talk about that later, but um, they all have a secret. And as those secrets are unveiled, what ultimately happens to these embryos is decided. You know, I, I, uh, one of the reasons I love this book so much is because, you know, you mentioned the secrets, but everyone has a complicated 
um, situation too. And everyone kind of has a situation to which there are no easy answers. Yeah. And I like that because I think a lot of times in fiction, you're reading along and you think, well, obviously this character should do this, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and you don't know whether they're going to do it or not, but you can, you kind of know as the reader what the right thing is. But in <laughs> this book, um, there's not necessarily a clear right thing. And, yeah. and I, I love that. I love that oh, kind of gray you. area you give us. Thank you. Well, I, that's my favorite thing, I think. And you do that so well too, is I think putting characters in situations where there's no right or wrong. I mean, there's no yeah. really clear decision. And I think we all face these moments in our lives when we feel like our back is kind of against the wall and we don't really have a clear way out or a, yes. even a good way out. And so we just have to do our very best and see, you know, what's going to happen. And I can see people in the comments, they want to know uh, how, how you contributed to that secret. So I'm going to tell, cause I don't even know if you remember <laughs> I was going to say, would you tell me how I contributed? Um, to no, I'm like, you probably don't remember this at all. Um, and I can't tell, I can't say too much about it because, but Kristen and I were in California with Mary yeah. Alice and yeah. Christina McMorris. And we were all, it was like a chilly night in San Diego. And we were all yeah. sitting outside by a fire and we were all talking about our next projects. And I was telling them about Under the Southern Sky and I said, you know, um, the book is finished. And I was like, but I just feel really strongly that Greer and Amelia, they're these two women who in life, they knew each other vaguely, but they weren't friends. They didn't know each other very well. And I was like, I just, I want them to have a secret with each other that no one knows about, not even Parker. Um, because I feel like that would really like add another dimension to this story. And so we all sat out there and like talked about it for a while and tossed around. Um, and actually Kristen had a really good idea that I ended up not using, but I really, really <laughs> liked it. But in the not using it, it actually made me think of what I did ultimately end up using. So it was, you know, and I think that's what happens. It's like to have people to be able to talk those ideas out with, um, it's so helpful because it's hard. I mean, most people don't really understand what you're doing or what you're trying to achieve or, you know, what that means. And so your author friends are so helpful in like helping to figure out those little plot twists and That's all of that. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. I have such a clear memory of that night. We did toss yeah. around that and we were coming up with titles for Christina Morris and McMorris's new yep. book too, right? Yep. Yep. We, yep. we were just a collective force of unstoppable genius. By the we were, in that San is, Diego that night. You know what? You said that so well. Yes. It's what we were a collective force of unstoppable genius. I think that. So <laughs> now, if only we could do that the other 364 days of the year, right? Yeah. <laughs> what <Whoop>. looks like <laughs> that no 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 problem at all yeah so um just kind of back to those complicated situations though um to me that's one of the things that makes this book such an enjoyable one to read because you get so emotionally invested in these characters and and you're rooting for them to make the right decision but you don't know what that right decision is so you're kind of experiencing it firsthand for yourself as you're reading along, which I think makes your heart, you know, kind of twisted up on, with the words on the page. It's just a fully immersive book experience. So, you know, well, you. I, I, I loved it, but I've said that to you a million times. Um, you're so sweet. A couple quick reminders out there before we go on. If you are thinking about getting Under the Southern Sky, even if you've bought it already, it makes a great gift. Um, we do always ask that you consider buying it from the host bookstore, which right now is Bank Square yeah. Books. They go out of their way. They do, you know, these great events. Um, you know, they give us this platform that we can talk to each other and talk to you. So if you're thinking about buying it, it would be a great purchase this week from Bank Square Books, especially because we just passed Independent Bookstore Day. So another great way to celebrate yes. Independent Bookstore That's Day. Right. Um, and don't forget to leave your questions for us and particularly for Christy in the Q&A. We would love to take those. So Christy, um, you wrote this book essentially over, you know, I know you'd started it before the pandemic, um, yeah. but, but you were still working on it when the pandemic started. And it's mm -hmm. just been a crazy, um, crazy complicated time to be writing. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about what was going on behind the scenes while you were writing Under the Southern Sky and how it affected the story? Yeah, well, it was so funny when I sat down to write the acknowledgements of this book. I think, I, I don't remember exactly what the sentence was, but it was something like, I started this book, you know, when we were like out of our house from a hurricane yeah. and then edited it during a pandemic that felt like a dystopian novel. I mean, it was a really, yeah. and, it, and so it's so funny to think about like all the craziness. I mean, we were out of our house for, 
15 months. We moved like 11 different times. Um, we were of the all over because yeah. of the hurricane. Yeah. yeah. So we were all over the place from that. And then, um, you know, just my, my mother-in-law who was, who we had moved down with us had passed away. It was, was, you know, passing away during all of that. And then, um, I lost a really good friend during that time and then the pandemic. And so it's kind of funny to like, look at this book and, I mean, there are definitely some serious things that are covered here. And I, you know, there are definitely some sad moments. I mean, as you can imagine that there would be in a story where someone really beloved is gone and out of the picture, but, um, also it's a really happy book. You know, there's a lot of lightness in this yeah. book. And I think that, um, somehow that was just like my place to escape. And it was where I was sort of like putting all of those things that were going on and, um, in my life. And I think in some ways I felt very uprooted during that time. And I mean, oh my gosh, I will never forget like leaving. We were at one of our rental houses and I was leaving to go on a six week book tour. And, um, we had to leave this house and we were like trying to find somewhere else to go. And I was like, what is happening right now? I just need to go home. Um, but that was for, but yeah, book tour for, um, the Southern side of paradise. But, um, anyway, it, it really was a crazy time. And I, I think that just my feelings of uprootedness really, um, kind of were in these characters. I mean, Parker and Amelia are both in times in their life where, you know, there's so much going on and Amelia in particular, I mean, as the story opens, she's finding out that her marriage is not at all what she thought yes. it was. Yeah. And, um, then loses her job right after that. And those are kind of the two things in her life that she always knew she could depend on and they're yeah. suddenly gone. And I do think there is something to that. And I think we've all experienced that in this past year, you know, the Absolutely. things, yeah, the things that we have come to depend on are yeah. no longer what they once were. I mean, we can't, you know, go hug our mom when we want to. I mean, just the crazy little, just the tiniest things that we took for granted, um, you know, really have become front and center this year. So um, all that to say, I mean, I do think it, there, you know, there is a lot that went into the story because of that, but I also feel like it was a really good time for me to be able to write this story that was hopeful and happy. And, um, and I wanted everyone to have a happy ending, you know? Yes, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, it's interesting that you say that about being uprooted, because as you were talking, I was just thinking that that's kind of what Friends in Fiction was born, born out yeah, of, you know, we, we absolutely for that. Sorry, for all those out there who don't know what Friends in Fiction is, um, it, it's a it's a Facebook group. I think we have about 37,000 members now, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, we're thrilled. Uh, people talk about books. <laughs> we're all shocked. Long. We're shocked. <laughs> we don't know how that happened. Where are all you people coming from? No, this is great. Um, but we support different independent booksellers um, each week. And we have a Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern show mm -hmm. um, where we talk about books. So last week we featured Christie's Under the Southern Sky. This week we're talking to um, Chris Bojalian, um, which should be fantastic. But, you know, Friends in Fiction was really born out of that idea of being mm -hmm. uprooted, right? I mean, we had all oh, just yeah. had our, our book tours canceled in, in an instant. We didn't know how we were going to write our next books, how we were going to connect with our readers. Mm -hmm. And something beautiful kind of bloomed out of this <laughs> uncertainty, right? And, and I feel like that's kind of... Uh, just as you were talking about, that's something we really see in your book too, something beautiful mm. blooming out of the uncertainty. And then the idea that it's not always the thing you expect that comes from that uncertainty or mm. that comes from finding that way forward. But, you know, maybe sometimes you have to be uprooted to to figure out where you're supposed to be planted again. It's you know? so true. I think that's so true. And I do think that's like such a good analogy. I mean, for friends and fiction, yeah. because you know, we were all in such a hard time and we never, ever, ever would have done this if we had had a normal year. If we had been all on tour, we wouldn't have had time. We wouldn't have had the no. bandwidth to think about it. We wouldn't have had the motivation to do it because no. why would we start this Facebook thing when we're all out on tour? We never would have yes. done it. And um, so I think you're completely right about that, is that you do have to be uprooted to yeah. sort of find where you're going to go next. And that pivoting, I mean, that's what we were all doing. I feel like that's like the word of yeah. 2020 is- yeah. And I think, um, I think we all got together and we were like, okay, we're going to make this work. Like yeah. whatever it is, whatever it looks like, we're going to make it work. And I think, um, that's what friends and fiction really was for us. It was our like big pivot of, okay, we're not, you know, 
instead of being our individual selves on our individual tours, we're going to be a group and our readers are going to come together. And, um, but I, I will, I don't know if you agree with this, but I just don't think that we ever could have really imagined what would have come out of this. Oh, I, I completely agree. Yes. And I, but I feel like those are the most beautiful things sometimes the ones that you start at the beginning with your heart in the right place and, you know, putting all your energy into it. And then it turns into something you couldn't have envisioned. I, mm-hmm. I, and I feel like that about this book too, you know, yeah, and, and, you. you know, the other thing is, I feel like, I don't know if you agree, Christy, but I feel like we've all grown. I have grown as a writer this year, just mm-hmm. by my exposure to you and to Patty and to Mary Kay and to Mary Alice. Like, I just feel like working so closely with the four of you has developed me as a writer and a storyteller Yeah, too. we talk about that a lot. We've really taught you so much. <laughs> you have, all of you, but, I, but yeah. I, I learned from all of you, you know? No, I love that. That's, and I and I do agree with that. And I, yeah. I think that, um, you know, having people to kind of go to and say, yeah. what do you think about this? Or what do you think yeah. about that? Or what would you do in this situation? And um, whether it's a story or even just, um, you know, just something about the business that we've never really understood. Or I was talking about this last night on an event was, you know, just how much you guys have like really, really taught me and mentored me. And it's been incredible. And I mean, you know, it's not like you're much older than I am. <laughs> so, like, you know, hey. I'm, but, but just, but I do think there's a really steep learning curve in this business yeah, and to be able, is. you know, to learn from people who have written more books than you have and have been in this business for a long time is really, really great. Well, I think we all learn a lot from you too. I mean, the, the, for one thing, you're way better at social media than any of us are. So we're like, explain how Instagram works again. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> all right, Christy, back to your book. Um, I, you know, I know we talked a little bit about this on Friends in Fiction, but I would love for you to talk about how you got the idea for this book and, um, and, and sort of the, the various threads that came together from your real life mm-hmm. that went into this novel. Yeah. Um, so it actually just started with a little spark of an idea, which I know, I think this happens to you too, but, um, I had a friend who came to me a few years ago and she and her husband were trying to decide what they were going to do with their leftover frozen embryos. And, um, she was just, you know, upset about it because she said, oh, we just didn't think about this. It wasn't something, all we were trying to do was, you know, figure out how we could, you know, have our family and how we could grow our family. We weren't thinking about what comes next. And I do think something that I learned and have, and I'm continuing to learn is, you know, this is not a process that I've been through myself. And so I think one of the things that I really wanted to deep dive into was how attached people feel to these embryos, even the ones that they do not use because they represent a piece of their family um, in some way, or this spark of hope or something like that. Um, and even, you know, it was a really crazy time for this book to come out because unbeknownst to us, it was like National Infertility Week. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. We had no idea. I was like, guys, good job. They were like, we wish we could have taken credit for that, but we had no idea. And I had no idea. So it was just like a happy accident. Um, but there was a big article in the New York Times on Sunday about a family who, um, or a couple who had had a child, like, you know, 20 something years ago, and then tried and tried and tried to have another baby. They were told all their embryos were used up and um, they found out, you know, like 25 years later that they had two embryos that had gone missing and had now been located. And they were, you know, understandably extremely upset. And she talked about in that article, going to the hospital and like singing lullabies to her embryos and stuff, because she just felt like they were her babies. And I thought that was so interesting because one of the early scenes in this book, but one of the first times that we meet Greer, who is Parker's late wife, is when she is at the hospital and she's like saying goodbye to her embryos because she knows that she's dying and she knows that, you know, I think she calls them all the life that will never be. Um, and, and so I do think that that really, that it's just continued to surprise me at, at what Um, people who have reached out to me and said, yes, that is such an experience that I've had of feeling really attached to something that, you know, if you haven't been through it, maybe you don't really understand how attached you might feel. Um, And so anyway, I just, I knew it was something I wanted to explore, but I knew that the stakes definitely needed to be a lot higher. And so um, I think, you know, having this, you know, having, having the mother of these embryos be gone and this sort of be the last remaining piece of her, I think it definitely raised the stakes on, raises the stakes on making this decision about what to do. Yeah, 
I, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And just what a cool, I don't know, just a, a cool concept about all the different ways we can bring life into this world and, and yes. the different, the different ways you can become a mother and a father. Yes. It's, it's, you know, what a beautiful time we live in that such a thing is Me possible. It, it was well, and you know, and, explore. and yeah, I think we're all, we're becoming families in such unique yeah. and, um, and different ways. And there are so many ways, and you see a lot of those like in this book, even not even through the main characters, but even through some of the secondary characters, just of how people create their families and what that looks like. And, how it can really be anything. I mean, it could be your Facebook group with yes. 37,000 members on Wednesday. That's night. true. They're our family. <laughs> You're totally right. Well, and you wrote a great essay for Parade Magazine last week too about um, about just that, about how family doesn't always come from the places you expect, but, you know, we can create our own families the way that, you know, the way that they explore doing in your novel, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Speaking of family in the book, can you tell us a little bit about Aunt Tilly? She was one of my (laughs) very favorite characters and, and not just because she was kind of um, in a way comic relief, right? Like she was a little bit of a funny character, Um, but also she was, to me, she was such a great representation of the way that family sticks together, mm-hmm. even if life doesn't turn out exactly the way you think it's going to. Mm-hmm. And I, I liked that, that part of that message too. Can you talk to us a little oh, bit about her? Oh, well, thank you. Yes. Um, she is, oh my gosh, she was really fun to write. And it's so funny to me. I mean, I think she's sort of everyone's favorite character in this book and I really did love her. And she was a surprise. I mean, she was not in this story <laughs> in my mind. Like it's just, as I started writing, she, you know, she showed up and she shows up immediately. Like she's on page two or something of the book. So I'm like, "Hmm, I don't know where she came from, but I love her. Um, But there's this kind of thing in the South where people will say like, oh, she's fine. She's just got the vapors. (laughs) It's just like, (laughs) like we're not, she's not all there. Like we're not really sure what's going on in her head, but she's okay. And um, uh, she, she was a really interesting character to write, but she did experience something pretty tragic. Um, earlier in her life. And ever since then, she's just sort of checked out a little bit. And her sister, Elizabeth, really feels responsible for taking care of her and making sure she's okay. Um, Out of sisterly devotion, but there's also more to that story that we learn a little bit later. But I've gotten so many emails from people saying, I wish you would tell us more about her, write more about her. So you never know. She, she did intrigue me as a character. I was like, hmm, you know, wonder what her past did look like and wonder, you know, how she did get this way and how much of her persona is real and how much of it is an act. And I think that's something that honestly, as the writer, I don't really know, but I think as the reader, you know, we're not really sure like what, how much of this is, how much of it is on purpose and how much of this can she not help? And, you know, I I don't know, but I think it, um, it's kind of a Southern stereotype too, you know, to have like the crazy aunt living in the East wing and that's Tilly. So, and that's, that's what Amelia is so terrified of becoming, even though she loves Aunt Tilly and she's like her favorite person in the world. It is her nightmare that she becomes, you know, the spinster aunt living in the East wing, dressing right. up in Victorian yes. outfits for the <laughs> church party. I mean, she's, yeah. So um, she's definitely an interesting character. She is. And I love that you mentioned she's sort of, you sort of, it is sort of the Southern stereotype to have that, <laughs> you know, kind of crazy aunt living in the East wing or whatever. Um, yes. But at the same time, she's not a stereotype. She, she's complicated and mm-hmm. she has a secret and yes. there's, there's a, there's a lot more to Aunt Tilly, I mm-hmm. think, than, than meets the eye. Yeah. And I knew right away when she popped in the story, I was like, she's, she's got a big role to play here and I don't know what it is. She's going to do something important in the story and I don't know what it is, but I know it's going to be her. So, well, and I love that we kind of get to be along on that journey as we find out what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to ask you, I think maybe two more questions and then maybe we'll see if Stephanie can come back on and um, pull some questions from the Q and a. So if you haven't left a question for Christy and there's something you want to know now is a great time to do that. But Christy, just because we were talking about Aunt Tilly and Southern stereotypes, and again, not that she is a Southern stereotype, but Southern settings, can you talk a little bit about the setting of your book and how you kind of bring it alive? Because Cape Carolina is not a, it, it, it's its a fictional town, right? This yes. Is not a, okay. Yes. So I would love to talk a little bit about where the idea for this town came from, how you painted it so vividly for us. Mm-hmm. And But before you talk about that, I wanted to specifically point out, you know, I know a lot of people here are coming, you know, watching today from the South. And I think to them, it's going to feel very familiar, Mm -hmm. but if you're not in the South and you can't get to the South right now, because we're not traveling to me, this is a great way to get there. I mean, for me, I live in Florida and I I do know that geographically, if you look on a map, 
Florida is the South, but Florida is not the South. So to me, reading this book was a vacation to something that's a little bit outside you know, of my experience, because we're all Northern transplants down here. We don't really yes, have that Yes, yes. Well, I South. mean, I, yeah, I, um, my old editor was from Florida and I would tell this story about her, you know, <laughs> and, about us connecting on this idea for Peachtree Bluff. And I said, she's from Florida, which is, you know, arguably the South, depending on who you ask, but most people would be like, no, 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 it's not, it's not. Um, but, you know, I do think growing up in the South, I mean, you, what I, I, I just write, I think, you know, people say, write what you know, and these stories are not what I know. I mean, I'm not writing stories necessarily about characters that I know or people that I know, or um, even something that's really happened to anyone in real life that I know, but these towns I know, you know, I mean, I know them. I know these people that reside in them and I know, um, I know these, you know, gossipy best friends living (laughs) next door to each other who, um, put bourbon in their sweet tea and want to run the town and everyone in it. You know, I know this, I know, I know. Um, So I think that really, um, that really is something that I try to bring into these stories, but it's honestly not something that I really think about that much. And I think, you know, people have asked me a lot on this tour, will you ever write about another region? And I think it's really hard to get another region, right? Um, And I have a lot of trepidation about doing that because there's so many things that I know, you know, as a Southerner, that if you don't, you know, live in the South, you probably don't really understand those nuances. Um, And so I know, you know, if I try to write a book about the Midwest, I would get that wrong. And I mean, I mean, I might be able to write the perspective of a Southerner that moves to the Midwest or that moves to California and what that experience is like for them. But I don't think you can ever get those like tiny nuances of being like born and bred somewhere um, quite right. And so I'm always afraid. So I'm always like, no, I just have to write about the South because I don't know any other places. <laughs> but, but you, you genuinely do it so well. I, I mean, and, and it's interesting that you say that because it is in those tiny details that the setting comes alive. I mean, it's, it's the way people talk, the way people think about things. It, it just, it, it's something that kind of saturates every page in a really, really good way. And you do that beautifully. I, I hope you always do that. I hope you always write about the South because I, I, to me, that's one of the, the things you do so beautifully. Well, thank you. Well, I'll have to laugh about this because I'm, I'm looking at these chats and Susan, who was on an event I did last night, I was talking about how someone was talking about pimento cheese and how, and they didn't know what it was. And they were like, that cannot be real. That sounds absolutely disgusting. And <laughs> Sherry, so who's our amazing event tech today said she's a born and bred New Englander, but she loves pimento cheese. Love. So I'm really glad to hear that, Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and there are those things that are like, perva- you know, that yeah. now have become so pervasive that, you know, they are sort of everywhere, but there still are little things. I mean, I remember being a little girl and we lived two weeks a month in New York city and there was no such thing. I mean, there was not Southern food. Like if I went to New York and I asked for grits, they didn't even know what that was. It wasn't like, Oh, we don't have that. It was like, what is a grit? (laughs) Oh, I mean, you know, there were just so many things that like, are just little things like that, that, you know, are very, very culturally different. So anyway, I love writing about the South and, um, it's fun. So I'll probably keep doing it. I don't know. (laughs) Well, as, as your longtime dedicated reader, I'm happy that you're doing it because you do it beautifully. I, I look forward to more trips to the South <laughs> through, through your beautiful work. And hopefully right. in real life too. <laughs> well, well, exactly. Okay, Christy, I'm going to ask you one more question and then I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie to do a little bit of the Q&A. Awesome. And my last question for you today is, um, you know, I... I don't often sit down and think like, what would my answer be to this? But I do think that I grow a little bit as a result of every book Mm -hmm. I write. Um, Even though I don't necessarily sit down with that intention. I don't think Mm -hmm. like, oh, here's an issue in my life that I need to explore. Here's something I need to figure out. But every every book that inevitably happens. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's any way that you grew or you changed or something you learned about yourself or something you learned about the world from writing under the Southern sky? Did did your Mm. own, did your own writing enrich you or your life in some way? That is such a good question. And definitely. Yes. I mean, it absolutely did. And actually thinking about moving forward. I mean, my 2022 book is finished, but thinking about what I'm moving into next, I really have been thinking like, what were some things that I did in under the Southern sky that I think expanded me as a writer and how can I make sure that I'm continuing to do that moving forward I definitely think this was I mean 
it is 100% a character driven book, just like it my is. other ones. There's no doubt about that, but there is more plot happening in this story. I mean, there is, there are definitely more things going on and like having something kind of at the center of the story, like those embryos that the action is kind of revolving around, even when you don't see them. Um, it, it was something a little bit different for me. It was something I hadn't really done before in that kind of way. And I liked that it was something that was timely. I liked that it was something that was an issue that people are talking about. Um, and so, you know, there, I do think that's something that I might do again, you know, assuming that like that inspiration strikes, I don't know. I haven't had anything, um, that's really leapt out to me. Like, yes, that's really something that I want to write about, but it is a little bit funny and you'll understand this, you know, obviously with your journalism background, but, um, I used to write a lot about women's health. And so these were issues that I had that I, that I knew about going into this story. And so it was really fun for me to get to kind of take something that I had studied and learned about, you know, in years past and be able to actually bring it into a book. That's actually a really good point. I have found mm -hmm. myself doing that in books too, without mm -hmm. even um, necessarily intending it. I also used to write a lot about women's health and yeah. Um, yeah, that's actually a really good point. I've never really thought about that before, but that's true. Well, cool. Well, Christy, those were all such great answers. Stephanie, do you want to come back in and, um, and maybe read some of the answers from the Q&A? Of course. We have had a ton of questions come in um, to the Q&A button, so that's awesome. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them, but we will do our best to get to most of them. We'll be, we'll um, be fast. We'll talk yeah. fast. Okay. 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 Great. <laughs> okay. Great. First one. Um, Michelle Marcus would like to know, um, she says, Christy, I heard you are doing a dual timeline book in 2022. What time period does it take place in? Hmm. Um, that is true. Thank you. Uh, so super briefly, the historical time period in the book is from 1914 to 1934. So it's not that long ago. It's not like, you know, going way, way back. Um, but it was really exciting. It's called the wedding veil and, mm. um, it's about the Vanderbilt, Edith and Cornelia Vanderbilt oh, and their fun. real life wedding veil that disappeared and oh, um, sort of my answer of maybe what happened to it. Love that it. sounds like a wonderful plot. Um, we'll definitely be looking forward to that one. And it does it, can you say when it comes out in 2022 or I actually have don't have a pub date yet. So okay. I have a Pe Christmas and Peachtree Bluff is coming out October 26th mm -hmm. um, of 2021. So okay. we haven't really set the pub date yet because all of a sudden we sort of sprung this extra book in. <laughs> so everyone's kind of like, we got to get Christmas and Peachtree Bluff ready. Um, but I should know soon, but I mean, I, it should be around this time, April, okay. May. Yeah. And Wouldn't it be awesome if it were in July and we could go on tour together if they both came so out like within fun. a couple weeks of each other next so year. Fun. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I, that. yeah. I think everybody watching this event would be all for that. Everyone has just been, <laughs> in the chat, everyone's just been begging for a tour and um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, next question. Um, I think it's Anissa. Armstrong Anissa? is Anissa. Anissa. Armstrong. Anissa sorry Hi, Anissa. about that. Um, so Anissa is wondering for both authors, what is the best writing tip that you have received and use in your daily writing? Mm, Kristen, you go first because I've been talking so much. Oh no, go ahead. Actually, I, it'll take me a second to come up with. That okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So the best writing tip that um, oh my gosh, there have been so many good ones. You know. Okay. So I think you know. Again, sometimes things just come to you at the right time. Yeah. And when I was thinking about writing the wedding veil, I had just started working on it, and I was really intimidated by writing um, these real life historical women because I knew you know it was going to be a lot of research, and I really had to get it right. And Kristen Hanna was on, she was our very first guest. And she said that every few books, you have to do something that terrifies you because it keeps yeah. you sharp and it makes you a better writer. And I was like, okay, yeah, this terrifies nice. me. I kind of want to do it. I'm going to do it. So that yeah. was a good one. That was good That's advice. That's a great tip. Mm -hmm. With, for me, it was probably advice I got a long time ago, um, which we've had a few people say on Friends in Fiction, which is that it's better to put the words on the page. And I'm not putting it eloquently, but it's better to put the words on the page than to agonize about every mm -hmm. word and you can always kind of clean them up later. So be yes. better to have pages full of words that aren't perfect than a blank page essentially. And, and you can always edit. So that mm -hmm. kind of removes some of the writer's block fear. Yes, that's right. the good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, those are both really great tips. Mm -hmm. All right, Rhonda um, says that she loved the flaws in the characters. Was it hard? And maybe, maybe without going into any spoilers, was it hard to take such a seemingly perfect Parker and give him such a dark secret? Mm. Oh, hey, Rhonda. Um, thank you for that question. Um, no, 
And the reason that I say no is because um, one of the things that I think my editor taught me that I love her for is she used to say to me all the time, she would put notes in my margins and she would be like, this character is too perfect. Rough them up. And that was her line. Rough them too. up. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there is kind of that tendency to want to make people so perfect that they are not realistic. And Parker is amazing and he's wonderful and he is an incredible man but he's not perfect. And he's done some things that he's not proud of. And I think everyone is like that. I mean, yep. none of us have lived a completely perfect, spotless, clean. Oh, I, I, I mean, have. I have, well, I mean, I have, <laughs> I was going to say I have, you know, I mean, I'm, it's not like, I don't, I mean, I don't think either of us have any like deep skeletons hiding in our closet or anything, for but yourself. Yeah. I don't know. Can you call me about it later? Maybe that'll be my next book. Yeah, <laughs> No, but you know, I mean, I think, I think there is something kind of nice about taking a character that seems really perfect and is a really great human being, but giving them a flaw that they have to overcome. Yeah. And, um, I think it added a real layer to this whole book. Um, and it's, I won't, I won't say what it is, but there's something in Parker's story that has to do with his brother, Mason, who, um, was kind of destined for fo um, baseball, football for football who wrote this book for baseball <laughs> stardom um and he got injured and it it he sort of ruined his life and he's never really been able to move on so that is definitely an element in the story that I really liked and um there's something that Parker kind of knows about that night that he's never really said and there's something he finds out about that night that um well not him there's something that some other characters in this book find out that actually really ends up changing their story too you know, I also think something we learn the more and more we write, you know, it because it's taken me some time to get to mm -hmm. this too, is the more, the more human flaws that a character has, the more, um, the more they kind of leap off the page and feel real because that's, mm -hmm. it's, it's the flaws we identify with, I think the flaws we connect to really deeply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, I think it's important. Yeah, I think it's important for yeah. sure. So the next question comes from Susan and there are, there are a couple of questions within this question. Um, okay. So when you finish a book, do the characters stay with you for a while? How long does it take for you to dive into your next story? And does the idea for your next book come to you while you are working on the previous book? And this is for both, both of you to answer if you'd like. Awesome. Um, okay. So definitely the idea for the next book comes while I'm working on the one before always. And I always think that it's so much better than whatever I'm working on at the time. And that, um, oh my gosh, this trash book that I'm writing right now, it just piss pales in comparison to this genius new idea that I have. Do you do that, Kristen? Um, I, you know, I do, but I don't let myself go down that trail because if I start going down that trail, I yeah. completely lose focus on the current book. Yeah, I can't either. I will say sometimes I'll let myself write a little bit because it gives me a lot of confidence moving into the next yeah. book. I love when I finish a manuscript and I have just maybe like 10,000 words in the next one, which is a lot. I mean, you know, it's, it's a, a ninth or eighth or a ninth of a manuscript for me. So it is a decent amount, but it's enough to make me feel kind of confident that I do have a story that's going to go somewhere. That's awesome. Um, I think my character stay with me forever. Like it was shocking to me. I said, I was not going to write another Peachtree Bluff book and then got this idea for Christmas and Peachtree Bluff. And like, I mean, I started writing these characters and I was just right back there with them. Like I knew them. I remember there was nothing like, oh, I don't remember this. Or, I mean, there were little details in the stories that I didn't remember, but as far as like the characters, I remembered them so well. Um, and so I do think that's maybe where that tendency to like want to write a sequel or want to write another book comes from. Do you do that, Kristen? No, it's interesting. It's interesting to hear you say that because I feel like once I've sent, and maybe that's the difference between being someone who writes series and someone who doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, I can't even conceive of writing a series. And I, I wish I could. I, I really wish I could write that way. But in my head, in a book, I take the characters on a journey that has a beginning, mm -hmm. middle and end. Mm -hmm. And when the story ends, I feel like I've said to the characters, like I've done, I've done the best I can for you. And, and I wish you well in your lives, go off and live. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it, it might also be that I tend to write stories that, um, that take place in the past. And that in a lot of cases, we see how it turns out in the present. So I really have sent them on like a 70 year journey. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then I, I feel very at peace with those characters and, and they're always with me, but, but not, not at the top of my mind, I would say. Yeah. Um, that, that makes sense. I totally get that. And, and I, I actually think I felt more like that. That's a good point about the series. I felt more like that before I had written the series 
now I'm like, oh, I could like bust these people's lives open again if I wanted to yeah. at any moment because I had That's to keep doing that, you know. Course, but before yeah. then, no, I couldn't have imagined. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so, oh, wait, where'd it go? I just lost the question I was going to ask. Um, okay. So, Barbara is wondering for each of you is there a part of the writing process that is the most difficult? Um, is it naming characters, coming up with plot ideas, making edits, and do you ever hit a brick wall? And then how do you get past the brick wall? Hmm. You go first on that one, Christy. Yeah, that's actually a good question because I'm in the middle of dealing with that right now and oh, outlining perfect. my next book, which is due in November. Um, and I thought I had it. I, I have a really strong first half. I, I outline really thoroughly. My outlines are like 15 or 20,000 words long. Um, my first half is solid. And like, I know, I know the first half is working, but the things I thought were going to happen in the second half um, aren't coming together for me the right way. Mm -hmm. um, and so for the first time, I, I don't think I've ever done this before. I'm just going back to the midpoint of the book and starting from scratch again. So for me, that's kind of how I'm um, working through it. And uh, yeah, I'm in the middle of this right now. And I, I feel very bad about myself as a writer at the moment. <laughs> Really oh am. Like, with, you know, with every book, you kind of have that feeling of like, have I lost it? Like, have I lost the touch? Can I do this again? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm at that point right now, but check back mm -hmm. with me in two weeks. Cause I think I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it is, it's every book. It's the process of this is yeah. the best thing I've ever written. This is absolutely horrible. Yeah. Who let me be a writer? Yes. Yep. This is the one where they find out I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. I mean, you do, yeah, they, you have they, to. The jig is up. You kind of. Yeah. Think like, like yeah. Oh, wait, they're now they're going to know. This is the time yes. they're going to know. Yes. So there, it is like really just shocking all those processes that you have to go yeah. through. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, and that, that happened to me with Under, the, with Under the Southern Sky. There was a way I thought the story was going to unfold and it wasn't working. And Yep. Um, I knew it wasn't working like in my gut, just in yeah. that moment, I knew you feel it. And so I kind of went back and redid it and it was not a popular decision. Like at the time, because I yeah. was talking to my editor about it and she was like, no, I loved the way that you were going to have this unfold. And I was like, I'm just telling you it's not working. It's, it's, and then when I turned it in, she was you. like, yeah. yeah, and you have to go with your gut. That's the yeah. only thing that, I mean, even sometimes you have to make some hard decisions too, yeah. because you know, everyone doesn't always agree on the path of your story. Yeah, that's, that is true. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm looking for one of the, somebody earlier asked, and it's, it may just be lost in, in the, the list here. Um, somebody earlier asked, and I'm so sorry if this was your question, I don't remember who it was. If you had, if you had to cut any characters or any major plot points, was there anything that Kind of changed very quickly or, or any characters that had to be cut? Mm, I think the only thing that I really cut out of this book, there were no characters that needed to be cut. And actually, weirdly, as I go through drafts, sometimes I add characters and I don't know why, but I do. Um, but the only thing that I think I really cut was some of Greer's journal entries, because I thought there okay. were a few that were in there that I liked, and I liked to learn more about her through them, but they didn't necessarily move the story forward. And so... They had to go. Right. What about you, Kristen? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I, I tend to overwrite rather than underwrite. So I think I wind up, cut. well, yeah, I, I, I take away people rather than add people and take away storylines rather than add mm -hmm. storylines. But I don't think there's been anything major in mm -hmm. the Book of Lost Names or the upcoming book, The Forest of Vanishing Stars that I can think of. Yeah, a, a character names change for me a lot though. Does that happen to you, okay. Christy? Like, oh my gosh, yes. And it's yeah. so confusing. And like I had named Amelia and the story Keaton. And then my editor oh, right. thought there yeah, were too many yeah. like gender neutral names in the story. But this is uh -huh. the only time this has ever happened to me. But I am like, her name is Keaton. Like that is who she is. That is her name. And I have the hardest time still to this day calling her Amelia. And this, I mean, <sighs> like I got to- it's, it's so funny because it's been a long time. Her name has been Amelia for a long time. And I just, and I have to like catch myself. It's really bizarre. You know, in, um, in the Forest of Vanishing Stars, there's a character who enters a little bit before the, the midpoint of the novel. Um, and he becomes kind of an important character. And he was, and always in my head will be named Baruch. He's a, mm -hmm. um, he's someone who's fled into the forest in Eastern Poland and his life intersects with the main character. But my editor just didn't like the name. She just didn't see him as like, the strong sexy guy he was supposed to be um and uh so we ended up naming him zeus which was um sort of short short for uh zeusia 
um, which was another common name at the time. Um, but to me, he's always Baruch. It's just funny. I, I yeah, yeah, funny. Yeah, so you get that. Yep, the name that feels right to you doesn't always click with everybody else. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a really fun kind of inside scoop there. That's really yeah. cool. <laughs> So we have just a few more minutes, unfortunately. I know everybody would probably love for this conversation to go on the rest of the day, but- Me too. We, um, we can't stay all day. Stay all day. <laughs> Can we just borrow doing that. That's so weird. <laughs> yeah. um, but one question that I do always love to ask, and it, and it looks like a, a couple of our audience members would like to know as well, um, for both of you, what are you reading right now? What are you looking forward to reading? Um, is there anything coming out soon that we should keep an eye out for? Hmm. Well, when I get home, my <laughs> next read is The Forest of Vanishing Stars. Which, so Kristen, can you tell us briefly about it really quickly? Sure, yeah, just, just re real quickly. So it's um, The Forest of Vanishing Stars. It's coming in July. Thank you for asking. Um, it is about a woman who is kidnapped as a little girl from her German parents by this kind of crazy lady um, who lives deep in the forest. And she mm -hmm. takes her east, east, east until they wind up in eastern Poland. Um, and then she grows up completely alone in the woods, virtually no human contact, but like all the survival skills. And then the woman dies and um, it's World War II and she comes into contact with a family of Jews who are fleeing the Nazis. And it's her first exposure to what's happening in the outside world. And so she has to make this decision. Do I stay isolated as I've always been taught is the only way to live? Or do I use the skills I have to maybe help other people survive? And so um, her life intersects now at many points with these people who were growing in number and um and uh eventually there's kind of a connection from her past that comes back and changes everything so the interesting thing about the book is it's based on the real life stories of um, jewish refugees who fled into the forests in eastern poland and survived the war by living there um, and there were groups that were over a thousand people in size that stayed hidden in the heart of the forest for more than two years. Um, and, and in these groups, almost everybody survived. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. Like the real stories behind the fictional story that I've written um, are fascinating and inspiring. And I love this story of people taking their fate into their own hands um, and, and in some cases fighting back. It's, it's really interesting. And I actually get to talk to one of those real survivors um, for this story, which was very cool. Yeah, there's so much research that went into this book. Like, I cannot wait to read it. And, you know, I mean, me Kristen story. would be like, oh, I spent the whole day researching what kind of bark and what kind of trees you could eat in the forest in yeah. Poland. And I mean, it's unbelievable. So I'm very excited to read it. I cannot wait. Sorry, sorry for the months I spent torturing you with all that newfound knowledge. I'm like, no, but go? now we're like, now we're like, if we're ever stuck in the forest, like we want Kristen to be with us because she, her survival skills are on point. I will build you a bunker and start a fire and teach you which bugs you can eat. <laughs> you can count on me. <laughs> so I did just pop a link into the chat for the pre-order um, to that book, The Forest of Vanishing Stars. So be sure to check that Thank out. Um, and then also your, um, your book, The Book of Lost Names, the paperback is coming yeah. out next month. That's so if right. anybody's interested in the paperback yeah. version. Actually, mm -hmm. in one of these big paperback, or one of these big crates I have next to me, I've got, yes, the paperback. I just oh, it's so pretty. Oh, I love Isn't the, it? oh, and your, your and cover's look, the same. It is, but look, Christy, it says it. New York Times bestselling author. <laughs> So exciting. It's so nice. <laughs> that's amazing. It's so awesome. It's, a, well, I, it's that's incredible. And I'm so glad that they kept the cover and that must be like a really, that must yeah, feel it was really a beautiful big. cover. I was so super happy did your, it. did your hardback reprints say New York Times bestselling author on them? No, they never changed it on my reprints. I, and I, and I never thought to ask. So, that's so this is literally the first time that you have seen your book yeah, that it says yes. New York Times bestselling oh. author. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yep, that's right amazing. Right. That's so exciting. Oh my well, God. I have, the feeling, I have the feeling that's going to be the case for you in T minus two days. So I don't know. Say. We'll see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, this has been such a fun event and um, we are so looking forward to all of the, the books that you both have coming out. Um, Christy, the one that you're working on for next year or for 2022 sounds amazing. Um, and Kristen will be, will be looking out for yours as well. So 
Thank you so much, everybody, for watching and chatting in. This has been a really fun and active chat. Mm -hmm. um, I loved earlier all of the, the, there was a lot of discussion about Southern foods, and I'm from Alabama, <laughs> and I really appreciated that. So, <laughs> lots of talk about hush puppies and grits. And oh, hush boiled, puppies. Boiled mm -hmm. peanuts. And <laughs> what, what, what about fried green tomatoes? I could do oh, yeah, fried green tomatoes too. right now. Yep. Fried green tomatoes with pimento cheese and some bacon. Yes, yep. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both Kristen and Christy. This has thanks. been a lot of fun. And of course, thanks to Sherry, who's been our Sherry. event tech in the background. We definitely appreciate all the work she's yes, done as well. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, Kristen, for coming oh, on and interviewing gosh. me and taking your day. And thanks, thanks to everybody that came. Y'all are amazing. We're so grateful yes, for all of your so, support. So much and come and watch us on Friends and Fiction. Exactly. Please definitely. do. And, and all of you out there, do consider buying a book from Bank Square. Even if it's not Christy's book, even if it's not my book, yep. you have both books already. Yep. There's a million great books out there you yep. can purchase. And, and it's a great way to thank them for putting on events like this. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Thank Bye, you so everybody. Much. Thanks. Bye.